stand by my true dog, cause I am the ruler of my state of do dog. Like boo da boo da da boo da. I stand by my true dog. Alright, what's up everybody? Happy New Year's! I know I'm a little late with that, but hey, this is my very first video of 2022. I got quite a few things to share, but let me first start off by giving a special thank you and shout out to Miss Kitty Lulu, Ramon, the Regalados, and everyone who has taken time to go on the social media platforms to download, listen to my music, share my music. to talk about this book, Destination New Earth, A Blueprint to 5D Consciousness by Alex Mark Hox or Mark Hooks with Shauna Kaliki, Daniel and Connie. If you are someone who for the most part know that there's something really big happening in the world, right? And we can clearly see that it is. And you've been a follower or viewer of my work for a while which this book t touches on a lot of the things that I and others like me have been sharing over the years you will appreciate this book Connie and Daniel I know them a lot of synchronicities with Daniel Daniel is and for you guys who remember the video I did about autism Daniel is the son of the lady that I had invited which who's Connie on my show about four or five years ago talking about autism. There's a lot in this book. Again, it's very, very different. Talks about what's going on behind the scenes, the nature of reality, the ascension process, but it's being brought in a way that is very, very unique. So I highly recommend this book. They are not paying me. They did not ask me to do this. I'm doing it because it is very relevant to the kind of subject matters that I talk about. It's very relevant to what's going on and what has been going on for a long time and it'll definitely open your mind's eye a little more when it comes to those that we label or identify as autistics. Depending on how many of you guys get this book, I'm going to share some stories involving Daniel who, com who contacted me telepathically some years ago and this was validated from multiple sources again it is destination new earth a blueprint to 5d consciousness i'm going to put the link to the book below this video description and i'm also going to put it on my personal website as a book recommendation all right now what i wanted to do in this video is talk about my grandfather and there's a lot to what I'm about to share with you. This is all very true, what I'm about to share you, with you. And there's more. And I will talk more about that at the end. And where I will be sharing, where or when I will be sharing the part two. My grandfather passed away at the age of 85. I was a teenager just out of high school. My grandfather was diagnosed with prostate cancer and diabetes. He was basically given a death sentence. Although he struggled with these two diseases for years. So what had happened was my grandfather's wife, something happened where the relationship just wasn't happening and they were estranged.
and they were estranged. So she was not available to take care of him because he he's now at an age where he really can't do much for himself. So given his condition, my, my mother, uh, my aunts, and my uncles at that time, they all were working. They didn't want to put him in a nursing home. He didn't want to go to a nursing home. They had a very beautiful house in Greensville, North Carolina. And so he didn't want any other option but to be home. So my mother came to me and asked me if I would be willing to move to North Carolina for a period to take care of and look after my grandfather. Of course, I'm a teenager. I'm right out of high school. I was, I was reluctant. My mind was really on going to work to help contribute to the household at that time. But my mother talked to me and she was telling me how all the aunts and everybody was on board with it because I would be the best option because I wasn't working. I was right out of high school. No one else was available to do it. So to make a long story short, I agreed to it and I moved to Greensville, North Carolina into my grandfather's house. I had a cook, I had a clean, um, he was very independent with bathing himself. All I had to do was bring him um, a washcloth, his bedpan, and change of clothes or what have you. But here's the thing, my grandfather was always a very strong-willed man, very strong, very prideful, um, didn't take no mess from nobody, um, even though he grew up during the time of Jim Crow, he didn't even take anything from the racists that he had dealt with during those days. He was a true warrior, let me tell you. So, being a man who was used to standing up and doing and fighting and fending for himself, I would imagine now looking back, that was quite humiliating for him to get to a point in life where he had to basically be at the back and whim of his teenage grandson. There are many of us, I, they, we, I have a very large family, but again, I was the only one who was ready, willing, and available to, to take on that job at that time. So, that made him kind of grumpy. Anybody who's taking care of uh, older people who can't really do for themselves, you know, they're very cranky, they're very snappy, and they even, may even come across as very cruel and mean. My grandfather was, was kind of snappy and mean with me. I remember the first night, I, um, the first night there, I was in a really good sleep. It was very difficult for me to, to sleep there because there was a lot of spirits around the house. And that, that leads to part two, where that was validated by his wife who was talking to a, the spirit of someone who had deceased. I picked up on that because you guys know I had that ability. So um, so the house was, was uncomfortable, and when I got there, it wasn't in the best of shape. So it, I had to do a lot of cleaning and organizing things just to get to a place where I can comfortably sleep. But anyway, my first morning, let me say my, four, my first morning there, I was awakened to my grandfather and his grumpy voice saying, and I'm going to try to imitate <laughs> imitate how he sounded and the way he said it. It's six o'clock in the goddamn morning and you still in the bed sleep. He now that's super mega early for me. I don't get up on on average at that time, especially I wasn't getting up uh, normally around until around nine o'clock because I already had it in my mind that I would get up around eight thirty, nine o'clock and fix him breakfast. He loved breakfast and he loved coffee. But no one explained to me that he was such an early bird. I didn't know. I, I'm thinking this was the standard time to get up and cook breakfast on on on, on as usual on the usual. So he was this this is what I was awakened to and then he said Get your ass out the bed. I want my coffee. Of course, it's my grandfather. I'm respecting him. I pulled myself up out of bed and immediately came to the realization that I'm not going to like this. <laughs> I'm not going to like this experience. So, again, it's a long story. I'm going to cut a lot of corners. It got to a point where, um, I would say about a month and a half, I called my mother 
and I told her I was not happy. I didn't like the situation. I was not comfortable. I can't sleep well. Um, and so my aunts who lived in Kinston, Kinston, North Carolina, they would come and they will um, come and sit with me or they'll come and pick me up to give me a break to kind of give me, you know, kind of pet pet me up a little bit because they understood what I was dealing with because he was not only grumpy like that with me he was grumpy like that with everybody because again he is the patriarch of the family strong man and now he's in this position so my grandfather health had started to greatly deteriorate now at this point his his he had a bed sore right above his lower back and it was it was like this big. It was so big that when you when you pull back the dressing, you could see his spine, his bone. It was the flesh. His bones were being exposed. The cancer was literally eating him alive. That's what cancer does, right? But to actually see it, the bed sore was not healing. Then remember, he has diabetes. So the combination, although he wasn't in a lot of pain, but the combination. We could see that there was a hole in his lower back, this big, bone showing, flesh showing. It was not a pretty sight. It was at that point that my mother, who always wanted to be a nurse, when she saw that, she said that now she understands why, in her own words, God didn't allow her to go down that path because when she saw that, she knew right then and there that she would not be able to handle a career dealing with and seeing stuff like that all the time. But let me come back to the point. So my grandfather's health was fastly deteriorating. He had to go to the hospital. He had a crisis situation. Now, it was already understood because prior to him going to the hospital that um, he would accept his one last surgery to help him out of the woods that he was in. But thereafter, he made it very clear. He signed papers. He told everyone in the family that he did not want to have any more surgeries and that if he were to flat, flat line or anything were to happen to him after the surgery to let him go. That was basically the arrangement. Everybody understood this. We knew that once he came out of the surgery, whatever happened, let it be. Do not try any um, life-saving techniques or anything. Just let him go. He agreed to this. He wanted this. Now, here's the thing. Just before they wielded him into surgery, right? My aunts, two of my aunts, and another cousin and myself, we went up to the hospital to see him before he went into surgery. He had a peace and calmness on his face that I had never seen, even before he got sick, right? And he, he called me to his bedside. And he looked me in my eyes. And he did not look away. He, he was literally looking in my soul. He took my right hand. And it's kind of, now I'm having an uh, epiphany because it was the same way I was holding my mother's hand. He was doing, he was grabbing and holding and comforting my hands the same way I comforted my mother's hand. Who, when she transitioned over, before she went over, when she came to me, she gave me that same touch with my spiritual hand, so to speak. So, my grandfather called me over to his bedside. Look me in, in my eyes, in my soul, and he just, and he was holding my hand, squeezing my hand. He just kept saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. I said, oh, it's okay, granddad. Because I guess he realized, he knew somewhere in there that that would be his last time seeing me alive. Because that's the piece I'm talking about. And he saw something. Now, let me tell you how I know he saw something before um, he went into his last surgery. He told my aunts, I wasn't in the room, but my aunts later told me, before he called me to his bedside, before I came in the room, 
he told my aunts that he had seen his son John Robert. John Robert left home at 17 because they were not getting along in the household. He, him, him and my grandfather, from what I understand, they were too much alike and they butted heads a lot. Very, very strong-headed, strong-willed men, right? From a different time. So my grand, so my grandfather was always looking for even my my mother, my aunts. They tried to find him years and years after he left home, but they could never find him. There's a follow up story to that too. I'm, there's so many stories I can pull out of this experience, guys. So, and this this what I'm sharing with you ended up getting validated later on down the line. But I will have to share that this part of the story in another video. My grandfather told my my uh, my aunts and my cousin, yeah, I saw my I saw John Robert, I saw my son, I saw my son. I can't tell you exactly where he is, but I saw my son. You know, because often family members come and help us transition over. So he was telling us then, which we didn't know what happened. Nobody knew what had happened to his son who had run away from home at the age of 17 many many years later they could never find him and we later found out that he was trying to find them but couldn't find them again whole nother story I, if you guys want to hear that story let me know below and I'll probably post that on my website so he thanked me I said, okay, granddaddy, it's okay. And he was, his eyes was welling up as he was telling me. He never looked away. He was looking me in my soul and, and was just thanking me so much. And 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 he, he also apologized because, again, he wasn't very easy to deal with. But he was at peace. He was really at peace. We parted ways and eventually we left the hospital. Got a call. Later that evening, they said he um, the surgery was a success, but he's not waking up out of the surgery. They didn't want to send him back home by himself. Again, I was the only one who could look after him, but now he's at a point where he hadn't come up out of... He was basically in a semi-coma. To make a long story short, my mother made the decision to make arrangements to have him, have the ambulance bring him up to D.C. We lived in D.C. at the time, and that we would all, meaning my sis, myself and my mother and my sister and brother, we all lived together, we would take turns in looking after him. So the arrangements were made. They brought him in, in, in the hospital bed. The ambulance, they brought him all the way up here to D.C. Now, mind you, he's still unconscious, and he had a rattling. This is how he was breathing. <laughs> but he was breathing on his own. But he was not all there. That's why I say, even though they didn't clinically diagnose him as being in a coma, when I tell you guys what happened, you will understand why I say that. So... They brought him, he, they, I would say they, they got him around noon from Greensville, North Carolina, and they, they got here in D.C., I would say around 6, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, somewhere around there, and they, they put his bed in the room where my brother and I, we, my brother and my sister, we all, at that time, we all shared the same room. We were really young, we were, but the room was nice enough to put a nice size enough to put his bed in. My sister was not there this particular day. I, right now, I can't even remember where she was. But my brother was in the room. So, they put his hospital bed next to the bed that I slept on and left. Now, again, my grandfather still, he never came out of this, this sleep he was on it. He never woke up from surgery because remember, they, he, he was, it was already understood that no matter what, no life-saving um, techniques, do not try to res anything, just if he goes, he goes. So, I would say it was around 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, my grandfather in the bed, <sighs> that rat 
rattling like a lot of mucus and something in the back of his throat and in his lung. He was breathing really loud and heavy like this. I'm on the phone talking to Tana. Tana is a long time good friend of mine. I did a video with her some years ago and we, we did a uh, song together. I, I was on the phone with her and I was talking to her. Wasn't really thinking about much of anything. And then um, the conversation ended. I hung up the phone. Now, mind you, I'm still aware my grandfather is in the room, and I'm, I'm starting to fall asleep, even though his breathing is very rattled and loud. And as I'm going to sleep, I'm hearing him. And then I heard this. Dead silence. And I'm laying there and it didn't hit me right away. I laid there for about two minutes before it hit me. Then I sat up and I realized he stopped breathing. So I said, Granddad, Granddad, and I shook him. Nothing, right? So I then go out the room and woke my mother up, and I said, Grand, Granddad, stop breathing, Granddad, stop breathing. So my mother got up and came in the room, and she was shaking him, and she, she was holding his hand, felt for a pulse. She said, well, he's gone. There's nothing we can do. This, this is what we, he wanted. This is what we agreed to. So it's late. We, you know, they no point we might as well just let him be here and we'll get up early in the morning and we'll call the right people to come and get get his body then my mother said well y'all just go on back down and lay down and go to sleep i'm like i don't think if y'all want us to just go to you want us to just go to sleep and our grandfather is in the, in the in the bed no longer breathing no longer alive i can't just go to sleep after that and here's the thing as he was taking his last breath here is my hand. I literally felt his breeze like a wind gush flow through me. It was like I, my mind wasn't putting it all together. But if you know how you retract what you experience, um, and you you realize when you retract, you missed something that was obvious, but you didn't really pick it up before. I literally felt his spirit and his energy whoosh through me as he was taking his last breath. So my mother was like, y'all just go ahead and lay down and just, there's nothing we can do. But I also realized my mother, she was trying to quickly get us out of, out of the way because she didn't want us to see her cry. I get it now. I look back on it. I get it now. But so what she did was well, she said, okay, well, y'all can just come on in here. So we, we, we um, went in the living room and we laid down on the, the left seat in the couch and my mother just closed the door. And we got up early. I never went to sleep. And I'm sure none of us slept that night. Got up the morning. Soon sunlight came. My mother called the right people. They came to get his body. Now, now here's the thing. We went in the room. And here again, here is my hand. My grandfather was laid back. So he was already cold. But... He was laid back. He had a smile on his face. And he looked so relaxed. It was literally like the sun was shining on his face. He looked so happy and so at peace. Now, there are other parts to this story where my grandfather visited me on the astral plane and I didn't recognize him. And I'll tell you guys why. Again, you want to hear part two and three of these stories? I need you to let me know in the comments section. That's it. I want you guys to please continue to support this channel. Donations are welcome. It incentivizes me to do or make more content. On that note, I want to say thank you for sharing this time with me. And also, forever and always, you are love beyond measure. And keep your head up. Happy travels.